This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Hearst Conference Room. Uh, it's good to be back, and uh, I'm glad you all survived the uh, snow and the subsequent 70 degree weather this weekend. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, a nice change. So it's uh, good to kick, kick things off with uh, Dr. Gina Lundberg with us. You all know Gina, who joined us after the merger with uh, St. Joseph's Hospital and uh, came to us with a strong interest in a national presence in women's and cardiovascular health and has certainly continued on a very uh, strong upward trajectory in that area and has become really one of the leaders in the country in this area, very nationally recognized for her contributions and her passion for this area. <clears throat> also very, uh, very active on social media, and it is one of the top 10 women uh, in social media, in cardiovascular social media. Um, uh, recently, I don't know who announced that, but it, but she's on that <laughs> list. Gina made up the list. <laughs> no, no, she did not make up the list. Um, uh, but also very active in the, obviously, in community outreach and uh, making sure this message leaves the academia and gets out into the public. So. We're really happy to have Gina with us today. She's gonna to tell us about heart disease and stroke in women and how we can prevent things. Gina, yeah. welcome. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, this is gonna be a very clinical talk, so I uh, hope you uh, researchers will bear with me, but hopefully you'll find some interesting things here today. Uh, I have no disclosures. So we're going to review the current guidelines as they pertain to women and heart disease and review some interesting sex-specific studies on heart disease in women. Uh, we're gonna review the AHA, ASA stroke prevention guidelines in women and discuss some of the unique risk factors in women for cardiovascular disease. So we're gonna start with prevention of women and I don't know if any of you have seen this, but this is the CardioSmart patient education poster that's about women and heart disease. <clears throat> it, uh, goes over heart attack symptoms, other symptoms, unique risk factors, and it's great to have in your um, patient exam rooms. Uh, and I was very um, honored to contribute to um, CardioSmart with this. So here are the stats. And for years, we've all been saying more women are dying every year of heart disease than men. And then the 2014 data came out. And as you can see, the lines have now crossed. And actually, women have slightly less mortality than men. So things really are changing, um, but as I wanna review with you, there are still very high risk groups of women who are not seeing this mortality benefit. So when we talk about heart disease in women, there are traditional risk factors for women, but then there are also these unique risk factors that it's very important for the clinicians to identify. Um, as you all know, we have diabetes, smoking, obesity, and overweight, which is about 30% of our population now physical inactivity, hypertension, and uh, unfavorable lipids dyslipidemia. Um, but in women, there are certain unique factors related to our hormones in pregnancy, such as preterm delivery, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, autoimmune diseases that tend to be more common in women, breast cancer treatments, and this can apply to men, but more commonly women, and then depression and other uh, psychosocial factors. And interestingly, the traditional risk factors in women are not created equal. This is from a lovely paper from Dr. Nanette Winger. And she tells us that diabetes has a three to seven fold increase in women versus the two to three fold in men. Tobacco use is up 25% in women, particularly young college age women, and triples the risk for myocardial infarction. Hypertension is much more prevalent in older women, but also younger women. And obesity is much more prevalent among women in the United States compared to men. Physical inactivity goes along with that with a higher incidence of women reporting no exercise at all in the week. Also women have a higher prevalence of angina. They tend to have broader symptoms of angina, as you know, with jaw discomfort, pain in the neck, the back, the left or the right arm, and even the upper epigastric area. But when it comes to calf time, women have a lower incidence of obstructive coronary artery disease, 
And interestingly, women have a poorer prognosis compared to men. The clinical presentation in women can be difficult, particularly in the emergency room, if she's complaining of weakness or jaw pain or one of the more atypical symptoms of angina and heart attack. This is a very important paper that was recently published by Noel Berry Mayers and others talking about the problems we still face even though cardiovascular mortality and risk is improving in women. In a large study, <clears throat> only 45% of women knew that cardiovascular disease was the number one killer of women, and 26% of women found it embarrassing to talk about cardiovascular disease or even risk factors. There tends to be a stigma associated with cardiovascular disease with women feeling that it's their own fault if they're obese, hypertensive, or diabetic. Probably even more concerning as a physician is only 40% of routine primary care for women even includes a cardiovascular risk assessment, and only 39% of uh, primary care physicians said they felt comfortable talking to women about cardiovascular risk and doing a proper assessment. And much more surprisingly, 42% of cardiologists said that they felt well prepared to discuss cardiovascular risk in women, and sadly, only 22% of primary care physicians said they felt prepared. So as an academic institution, in our training, we need to make sure that we are working with the students going into OBGYN, family practice, and internal medicine so that they feel comfortable doing these risk assessments. Only 39% of primary care doctors felt that cardiovascular risk assessment was a priority. They felt like they were having to give their attention to other things, possibly metrics, such as talking to their patient about influenza vaccines, mammograms, colonoscopies. So right now, we're sort of in the middle of the cardiovascular guidelines as they pertain to women. The effective base guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease in women came out in 2011. And since then, as you all know, there have been many, many changes in our uh, risk assessment that need to be updated with a women-specific guideline um, coming out in the future. There are practice guidelines on um, cholesterol, on ischemic heart disease in women, myocardial function in women, uh, non-ST uh, elevation MI, ST elevation MI, stroke in women, which we'll go over, um, but also management of heart failure, and then guidelines on the management of heart failure, and then even EP-guided therapies such as resynchronization in women. All of these guidelines need to be merged together into a current package of guidelines for women and heart disease. And if you know who is in charge of that committee, I want to be on it. So this is the pooled cohort risk assessment that the AHA and ACC has recommended. And it does take into account sex and ethnicity but it doesn't put a weight on some of the other things that are important in women, such as how I've outlined diabetes as a stronger risk factor in women, or things like more women have hypertension and poor results with atrial fibrillation. So these are the current guidelines, and it really is a mixture and a hodgepodge of the guidelines. Uh, you all know that the hypertension guidelines changed in November, and now ideal is 120 over 80, and the maximum is 130 over 80. Of course, we want good diabetes control, good lipid control, lifestyle changes with increased physical activity, uh, low-fat diets such as the Mediterranean diet or DASH diet are all essential. And if we don't take time to discuss these in the office, women don't get the message that this is important. The solution to this in many organizations is, is to have a care team, a cardiovascular care team with a nutritionist, a nurse, or even a physical therapist or an exercise physiologist who works with patients to improve those lifestyles. <clears throat> smoking cessation needs to be discussed at every visit that you have with a female patient who is smoking. And then obesity with an ideal BMI of under 25, but it is predicted that over 38% of the United States has a BMI over uh, 25. <clears throat> So certain specific guidelines that were introduced in 2011 suggested that pregnancy complications be listed in the chart as a cardiovascular risk factor, specifically gestational diabetes, hypertension associated with pregnancy, pregnancy-induced hypertension, and of course, preeclampsia and eclampsia. Also, we need to be looking to these women for their underlying rheumatologic disorders that might be associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, 
and increasing data associated with psoriatic arthritis. And uh, hopefully you all know that um, Dr. Ijeoma Isiadenso, who's part of our Women's Heart Center team, has a real interest in rheumatologic disorders and cardiovascular disease, and she is our expert uh, for your patients who have that. Close observation after breast cancer, chemotherapy, and radiation. And as you know, a woman's risk for cardiovascular complications after chemotherapy may not manifest for as long as 20 years. Dr. Susmita Pararshar with our team is also have a, has a special focus and interest in this um, and is available um, for consultation. And then the social factors, the psychological factors, stress, even domestic violence, trauma, these are all very important in women's health and increase a woman's cardiovascular risk. And as you all know, Dr. Viola Vaccarina and Susmita, I'm sorry, Pujo Mehta have a real strong research interest in this area and a very important recent publication. So some of the controversies regarding women's care have to do with aspirin and statins. So the current U.S. Preventive Service Task Force recommendation that was issued March 2016 said this, for men age 45 to 79, aspirin is important if the risk outweigh uh, any risk of uh, GI bleed or hemorrhage. But for women 55 to 79, Aspirin may benefit women if the risk, again, are outweighed by the benefit. But for men under 45 and women under 55, they're not sure if it's beneficial. And for women and men over 80, there was no recommendation. So this leaves a lot of women in that uncertain zone of would aspirin be beneficial or not. Of course, for secondary prevention, aspirin is completely appropriate. And then statins. As you know, the guidelines that came out in 2013 had four treatment groups. So for a woman with a clinical ASCVD risk score of over 7.5% for 10 years, statin therapy is appropriate. And this would very likely still be primary prevention. Uh, for any individual with an LDL over 190, treatment is appropriate. And it's very likely that this patient has familial hypercholesterolemia. For individuals 40 to 75 without clinical ASCVD, I'm sorry, with diabetes or an LDL of seven, I'm sorry. For individuals 40 to 75 years of age with diabetes, an LDL of 70 to 189, it's appropriate treatment. Um, no comment on if the LDL is below 70. And for individuals without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or diabetes who have an LDL in the 70 to 189 range with an ASCVD risk over 7.5, it is appropriate. And then there's a certain category that if you have an elevated calcium score and other risk factors, you may consider it as well. So let's talk about some of the things that are specific to women or more common in women. So we're going to go over thrombus formation versus plaque erosion and plaque rupture. We're going to talk about a bit about SCAD and then talk about SUBO cardiomyopathy. So plaque erosion in women is very interesting. In older women over 50 years, they tend to have more plaque rupture. This is associated with hyperlipidemia and a vulnerable uh, cap for the um, atherosclerotic plaque. In younger women, plaque erosion is more commonly seen and it is associated with smoking. Estrogen may protect against this and that's why uh, it's not so common in younger women. But eroded plaque is rich in smooth muscle cells and proteoglycans and there's less obstruction and less calcification. So this is your group of women who, although they have a calcium score of zero, may still be at risk if they have atherosclerotic plaque for erosion and subsequent thrombosis. This is from a lovely article on SCAD um, by um, Professor Tweet, and it goes through what SCAD is, and there is a difference in pregnancy-associated SCAD and non-pregnancy-associated SCAD. Pregnancy-associated SCAD is more related to hormones and the hemodynamic stressors of pregnancy. But this study outlined the difference in the non-pregnancy SCAD, which is this group over here. They have less STEMI compared to pregnancy SCAD. They tend to have a better ejection fraction overall, a higher association with fibromuscular dysplasia, they tend to be uh, multiparous, but not as strongly as in the pregnancy SCAD. Less infertility, so therefore less infertility treatments. 
and less preeclampsia. And the preeclampsia may turn out to be a very strong risk factor for women with pregnancy-associated SCAD. Um, a lot less left main dissection. Uh, a lot less multi-vessel SCAD. It tends to be more single-vessel SCAD. And these women are older, closer to the menopausal age, and overwhelmingly white females. So we also have myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries, or MNOCA is the, the new phrase for it. It's found in 6% of all myocardial infarctions with a mean age of 55. So this does tend to be a group of females that gets overlooked because of their young age. And this is happening in at least 40% of women. It's possibly due to coronary vasospasm, thrombotic disorders, but also structural dysfunction, and has a guarded prognosis with a better 12-month mortality compared to obstructive coronary artery disease post-MI. And then Takatsubo stress cardiomyopathy in women, which again, Dr. Pooja Mehta has done significant research in. And it does tend to be postmenopausal females, generally with extreme emotional or exertional triggers. And it's not associated with traditional coronary artery disease risk factors or obstructive coronary artery disease. This is a myocardial infarction that stuns the myocardium and affects multiple coronary artery territories which is a major clue to determining that this is not ischemic cardiomyopathy from traditional obstructive coronary artery disease. And then microvascular endo and endothelial dysfunction in women. It's defined as limited coronary flow reserve and endothelial dysfunction, which can be very difficult to diagnose. It is associated with a worse outcome than non-obstructive coronary artery disease, and these patients are at increased risk for cardiac death, stroke, and heart failure, so they must be treated and followed long term. And the annual major adverse cardiovascular event rate is about 2.5% in these women. As I said, diagnostic testing can be difficult in these patients. There's invasive coronary vasomotor testing. Um, there's brachial artery flow mediated vasodilatation, peripheral reactive hyperemia index, in new and promising work in PET and cardiac MRI. But even if you diagnose it, the treatment can be a real challenge in women as well. You do want to work on risk factor reduction and long-term risk benefits because as these women age, they're still at risk for traditional coronary atherosclerosis, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and specifically ranolazine have shown some benefit. And there's promising work with aminophilin and tricyclic antidepressants. So I'm going to move now to prevention of stroke in women. And again, this is the CardioSmart poster um, that you can have in your office. It's very clinically relevant and talks about the signs to watch for with stroke. One of the important things is people don't understand the difference in stroke and heart attack, and they tend to confuse the symptoms. And so it's very important for them to understand the difference. So stroke is affecting, uh, it's the major cause of disability in the United States. 200,000 more disabled women than men after stroke. So this is predominantly women who are disabled after stroke. But interestingly, women are more likely to live alone or be widowed before their stroke. So there are few caretakers involved. Generally, this falls on the children or the grandchildren. More often, women have to be institutionalized in nursing homes or assisted living after stroke and they have a much poorer recovery. Nearly half of the stroke survivors have residual deficits after six months, even with intense physical therapy and training. And there are more women living after stroke than men, 3.8 million compared to 3 million men. So this is heavily affecting our elderly female population. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in men, but the third leading cause of death in women. And stroke occurrence in 2014 was 4.1 million, and stroke deaths was over 77,000. So prevalence of stroke is interesting. This is by sex and age, and as you can see, um, the red is female. So after 80, much more women, but below 60, also more women. So it's affecting our younger women and our older women, and during that period from 60 to 79, slightly higher in men. 
Also, it affects more cardiovascular risk factors in women, and as you can see in column E and F, these are women with prior cardiovascular disease, I mean, I'm sorry, prior AFib, much higher risk, and if prior cardiovascular disease, much higher risk. And all the other categories of diabetes or cigarette smoking or just blood pressure, they are more common in men. So the more comorbidities, the more complicated the female, the more likely she is to have a stroke. So in 2014, we had our first release of guidelines specific to women in stroke. And I think it's interesting because this is 10 years after the cardiovascular risk factors for prevention of heart disease in women were published. So we've been very slow to look at stroke, try to prevent stroke, and cardiologists in general have been very slow to accept this as one of our parts of the body, one of our areas of domain. So there are risk factors that are sex-specific in women. Again, pregnancy, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, use of oral contraceptives, postmenopausal hormone use, and changes in hormonal status. And then there are risk factors that are stronger in women. Migraine uh, with aura, this is very important. And if you can decrease the incidence of migraine, it seems to help. So it's important for these women to get proper treatment. Atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and physical um, and hypertension, and depression and, psych so depression and psychosocial factors. Things that are common for both are physical inactivity, age, prior cardiovascular disease, obesity, diet, smoking, and even metabolic syndrome. So aspirin is beneficial for the prevention of stroke in women. Um, over 65 especially, 81 milligrams or 100 milligrams every other day. Again, if the blood pressure is well controlled in an uncontrolled hypertensive patient, you do not want to add aspirin. And again, low risk for GI bleed or other hemorrhage. And it may be re reasonable for women under 65 for the prevention of ischemic stroke. The Women's Health Initiative showed that older women have, uh, with pre-hypertension, so again, that was in the, at this stage, it was, uh, 120 to 139, um, had a 93% increased incidence of stroke compared to normotensive women. So a much higher risk. But if they got treatment, they had a 38% risk reduction. So it's really important to identify these women early and start treatment as opposed to, well, we'll look at it again in six more months. We'll look at it again in 12 more months. Early intervention is important for risk reduction. So I'm going to spend a minute on pregnancy. So pregnancy-related hypertension is the leading cause of both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke in pregnant and postpartum women. Luckily, stroke is not common during pregnancy, but the risk for stroke is much higher in pregnant women compared to the general non-pregnant population with 34 per 100,000 as opposed to 21 per 100,000. And the highest risk is in that third trimester and the postpartum time. There are risk factors that indicate who's at risk for pregnancy-induced hypertension, and it's more common with obesity, chronic hypertension, previous gestational hypertension, age over 40, so this is your female with advanced maternal age, pre-existing diabetes or renal disease, personal his family history of preeclampsia, first-time pregnancy, but also multiple pregnancies, pre-existing vascular disease, and then the collagen vascular or connective tissue disorder is associated with stroke as well. So there's a class one recommendation for women with chronic primary or secondary hypertension or previously previous pregnancy-related hypertension mm -hmm. to take low dose or 81 milligram aspirin from the 12th week of gestation until delivery. And in women with evidence of low calcium intake, calcium supplementation should be considered at least uh, a gram a day to prevent preeclampsia. Severe hypertension in pregnancy should be treated with safe and effective medications, which you all know, methyl dopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. Um, and a maternal fetal specialist involvement is very important. So treatment of hypertension postpartum. Probably the most important thing we can do as clinicians is make sure these people are followed up with. Too often the message has been, you've had the delivery, your blood pressure's fine, everything's back to normal, you're fine. But we have found that the risk for stroke 
is still there one to 30 years after delivery. And so these women really need to have follow-up with primary care or cardiology. So you want to see these women back within six months, 12 months at the most, and they need to have a general cardiovascular risk assessment. They need to be encouraged to get back to their pre-pregnancy weight or an ideal weight if they weren't at that prior to pregnancy, and they need to be followed as a risk factor for long-term heart disease. And of course, they need it to be treated if they have continued hypertension, obesity, smoking, or any dyslipidemia. The groups at highest risk for stroke with oral contraceptives tend to be older women. A lot of women from 45 to 55 are still on their oral contraceptive as their segue into early postmenopausal hormone therapy. Uh, women who smoke and women with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, hypercholesterolemia, and of course any woman with uh, clotting disorder uh, or a thrombotic mutation such as factor V Leiden, protein C, protein S deficiency. And then hormone therapy is not approved for any prevention of any chronic disease by the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. Now, women who are on hormones up to the age of 59 may be safe, and there's some new studies, which is a whole nother talk, that suggest they may help delay atherosclerosis. These are KEEPS and ELITE and SMART. But currently, there is no recommendation for any prevention of cardiovascular disease with hormones or SERMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Atrial fibrillation. So in two weeks, Dr. Annabelle Bogman will be here to talk specifically about AFib and stroke. So I'm only going to hit the highlights, and I want you all to come back in two weeks and hear her. But it is the most common arrhythmia. And it is a modifiable stroke risk factor. There are things you can do to reduce the risk of stroke, primarily anticoagulation. AFib does increase the risk of stroke four to five fold, and it's associated with higher death and disability. The stroke risk from AFib increases with age, which is why the CHADS VASC includes age of 65 to 75 and 75 and higher. And it's about 1.5% for persons under 60 but can jump to 25% for patients over 80. So this is commonly the white little old lady who develops um, atrial fibrillation. It's much less common in blacks, Hispanics, Asians, or other ethnic groups. And 60% of AFib patients are 75 or older women. So the female sex is an independent risk factor for stroke and AFib, and as you know, it gets a point with the chads vas score. And just briefly, the chads vas includes hypertension, age over 75, age over 65, diabetes, stroke or TIA, thromboembolism, vascular disease, and again, the female sex. And if your patient has a chads vas of two or higher, you definitely need to strongly consider anticoagulation. So in summary, cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of death for women in the United States with um, coronary heart disease number one and stroke number five. Women do need aggressive risk reduction for prevention of heart disease and stroke, and this has to happen in our clinics, but it also has to happen in the primary care clinics. We have to be reaching out to the OBGYNs, internal medicine, and family practice, and we have to make it so that women want to talk about these risk factors. There can't be any shaming involved. We have to get rid of the stigma associated with somehow cardiovascular disease is my fault, I'm fat, I'm lazy, I eat too much Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we have to keep in mind these unique risk factors of pregnancy, pregnancy complications, hormones, inflammatory states, and stress, depression, and trauma. These are all associated with increased risk for both stroke, and heart disease. So I have to take a minute to tell you about the Women's Heart Center. Hopefully you guys have heard of us. Uh, we've been around about four years now. We have an excellent team of outstanding researchers and clinicians. Dr. Nanette Winger is our con uh, founding consultant. And Dr. Leslie Shaw is our research director. And Dr. Pooja Mehta is our translational research director. But we have a wonderful team of nurse practitioners and physicians who work with us. Our number one priority is to um, screen and educate women, and 
uh, try to promote women in research. And we have a project that also hopefully you've heard about. It's called the 10,000 Women Project. Uh, we've been doing this about three years now. We go out into the community and do screenings for cardiovascular risk. This is our team who, this was Martin Luther King weekend. So on Saturday morning, the, the team was uh, downtown working to screen uh, African-American women. We do uh, a cholesterol check. So we do the ASCBD risk marker on all of these women. We ask about their pregnancy history. We ask all the risk factors um, that I've outlined with you and some others associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and some other issues in women. And then we store this data and then <clears throat> we look at it to see what, what's showing up. Um, we've screened um, close to 1,000 women now um, and it's very exciting and the staff has been wonderful in um, supporting it. Our nurse practitioners and PAs um, largely do this uh, and we're very appreciative for all their hard work. And then we do put on, a, on an annual CME event. Um, as I've said several times, it's important to teach the physicians-to-be, um, to work with people in training and nursing or um, as physicians or in other allied health uh, and health-related areas. And so every year we put on a conference. This uh, is Dr. Ijeoma Isiodenso is the co-director with me. And every year we look at important topics at women, and um, many of you have spoken at it. And um, if you have something you would like to share at the conference, we would love for you to uh, be a speaker. It's going to be August 18th, 2018. Um, at Villa Cristina. So if any of you are interested in sharing your research or knowledge at that event, let me know. And with that, I'll take questions and answers. Thanks, Gina. I'll start you off with one. So you talked about uh, rheumatologic disorders and women and how we need to pay <clears throat> place special attention. Uh, I mean, are there sort of special guidelines for us for that? I mean, because that's, uh, it comes up as a risk factor. It certainly makes us look a little more closely. Um, but I guess in your experience, how do you, how do you handle those patients differently other than sort of increased awareness? Well, it starts with awareness um, for the rheumatologist to know it's important and to reach out to us or um, someone who will modify their risk factors. And then just to keep watching them. So um, good control of their underlying inflammatory process is important, but a lot of times um, these patients, these women, because they're in chronic pain, they have joint pain, they're not exercising. And obesity and sedentary lifestyle is huge with them. And it's important to educate them why it's so important for them to stay active, whether it's, you know, water aerobics or gentle walking or walking five minutes three times a day, um, so that they really understand the process, that they're all focused on you know, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, but they need to understand they're, they're probably going to live through that and die of a cardiovascular complication. And then a lot of times doctors, um, particularly rheumatologists, don't want to put these women on statins because they're already complaining of muscle aches and joint pain. And so it takes a really motivated person to say, I'm going to work with you on this. We're going to find a solution. I always refer back to Apollo 13, failure is not an option. Um, and work with some of the non-statin drugs. Um, well call, Zedia, um, really strict diets. I would tell them all, if you want to become a vegan, that's great. It might help your inflammation as well as your cholesterol. Uh, and then blood pressure. A lot of times there's a lot of depression, a lot of chronic pain, depression cycle that's adding to this as well. So it's not that we have a special treatment yet, although we are hoping by classifying a lot of these people, certain things will start to pop up. And we would love to get guidelines for that, it's really just more about aggressive treatment and don't just push them to the side because, well, she hurts, I'm not going to put her on a statin. She might do fine on a statin, you won't know. And then, of course, if the lipids are really elevated, we have the PCSK9 injections. So interestingly, one of my patients with SCAD who has FH has um, fibromyalgia and she's a rheumatologist and we're always fighting he's saying don't give her the statin she hurts and I want her on the PCSK9 and it's really hard because we also have to encourage our rheumatologic fellows and colleagues that cardiovascular risk reduction is incredibly important in these people and we have to work together on that so the short answer is no we don't have guidelines or special treatment but it's that much more important to work on the prevention and just basic uh, prevention guidelines any other questions? Dad? I know that. Uh, 
I guess looking back uh, several years ago, there was a lot of emphasis on what happened to a young woman as they go older. About age 13, they stop exercising. Are you doing anything with that? Is that you fall off, you look at women versus men, and men will continue to exercise till at least 19, 20, and women tend to stop much earlier. And it looks like that's an area that needs some emphasis. Yeah, it definitely is. There's an organization here in Atlanta called Girls Inc. And Dr. Cutchins and um, Alicia L uh, Lyles worked with them um, a few months back on a program of getting girls to stay active and engaged and understand risk factors that they want to implement a healthy lifestyle, definitely mid middle school into high school. Um, there's a lot going on at that stage, though. Women are moving away from science in school. Women are getting more sedentary. Uh, women are young girls. They're not women. These young girls are, are making a lot of lifestyle and career choices that we're really trying to get to them with education on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, medicine, but also stay active. Um, this whole campaign, Run Like a Girl, have you heard of this? So if you take, like, four-year-olds, and you ask them, how does a girl run? They just run. They look at you like you're crazy. But if you take a 13-year-old girl and say, how does a girl run? They do this floppy arm, silly, goofy run. That's a taught process. We've taught them that girls and boys are different when they run. So there is a lot of emphasis through government and public health organizations, um, particularly the American Heart Association, to get into the schools and keep girls active. Um, it's helped a lot that we have Title IX, so women's sports are... Um, paid for equally with male sports. Um, but a lot of it comes from their mother. If mother never exercised, the child doesn't exercise. It's really important to get the message to the mother who affects the whole household to keep your young girls active. But it's not just girls. It's all of our children. Uh, the obesity epidemic is, is just ever mounting with uh, children. So we are working with organizations in Atlanta, but there needs to be a much broader uh, appeal to schools and organizations to keep women exercising, keep them healthy. You know, they've taken PE out of most of the middle schools and high schools. Right. Or they may do PE every fourth day, and that rotates with Spanish and art. And it's just not a priority uh, in the schools, and it's not enough of a priority with our government. As I recall, there's only one state, and that's Colorado, that has physical education for all through all the classes. And interestingly, they're the most healthy state yeah. of the 50. Gina, that, that was great. And thank you for your leadership in this area. Um, do, do, we, do you think there's a need or value for us to have a, a truly sort of multidisciplinary approach to some of these women with, with uh, chest pain and uh, refractory chest pain, because as, as you well know, it's oftentimes very hard to figure them out. And frankly, within the Emory system, it's not, uh, within any large health system, it's not always easy to then set up a rheumatology appointment, a GI appointment, nutrition, you know, perhaps psychology, et cetera. So uh, do you think there is a role for a truly sort of multidisciplinary approach in the Women's Heart Center where you know, one of the patients come in and then all these various specialties are available either at the same time or during the same week where you can have a very comprehensive assessment and direct, directing of their therapy and care. So there's like five things I want to tell you in answer to that, and I'm going to forget some of them. So first, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it does take, you know, the whole village. Uh, one small thing that Emory has implemented is over on the St. Joseph campus, we have the Emory Women's Center, and it's an integrated clinic. I'm the cardiologist there. Um, we have all of the OBGYN staff and pelvic health and Mary Dolan, the menopause expert. But we also have gastroenterology, we have dermatology, we have psychiatry, um, urology. They're just constantly adding to that team, um, and it's very exciting because um, where the doctor sits kind of a little fishbowl, and we do talk to each other, and we do say, oh, well, her stress test was fine, so now she probably needs an endoscopy or this and that. But you have to be together. And I think one of the things that the EMR has done is we're just so siloed. You just you kind of talk to yourself and send 
forward this note and send this message, but we don't get together. So that's an exciting opportunity to collaborate on women's health. My next thought would be it's not just for women. I mean, all of our patients need this, um, male and female patients. And then third would be that it really does take um, a team, um, not just for these women, but for all of our complicated patients. We need to, ha to be able to have liaisons in nutrition and physical therapy and exercise physiology who will really work with them on the lifestyle because as physicians, we don't have that time. And then women's heart centers um, in general and ours does try to have like these niches of focus, so again, um, Ijeoma Isia Densa doing the rheumatologic and cardiology, Sasmi De Parashar doing cardio and oncology, um, Carolina Gungora and Alexis Cutchins working with the high risk pregnancy. My niche is menopause and lipids. Uh, so we're trying to have something in the group, but it takes more than just us. Um, the Women's Heart Center team is open to anybody who wants to work with us, and we do use all of you for. Um, the ischemia evaluation for heart failure, for EP, uh, you know, so we all work together. We're not our own cog. We're in the middle of the whole pool as well. But if we don't have people who can work with them on this risk reduction, uh, they're not going to get better. <clears throat> and there's a lot of phone calls involved. They tend to be patients who are very complicated. They need to be seen back frequently. That's where we have to use our nurse, <clears throat> nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, and even um, nurses, nurse visits for, you know, working on certain risk reduction. So I would love to work to get something like that established, not just for the Women's Heart Center, but for all of our cardiovascular patients. Um, I think the testing is important because these women want an answer. So you tell them, oh, your calf looks good. There's nothing over 20%, yay, but she still has pain. So then you have to go down the microvascular testing or what just empirically treat them and see if they get better. But they want to know. They don't want to be like, well, we've excluded all this, and so you must have that. They really want to know what they have, and then there need to be guideline therapies directed specific to those women with microvascular dysfunction and chronic chest pain with non-obstructive coronary disease. So Dr. Taylor, if you'll just fund that. <laughs> When it comes to treating hypertension in women, is there any research looking at the various efficacies of the commonly used uh, uh, classes of uh, antihypertensive, in particular in women? Like, do you use ACEs first line therapy versus beta blockers versus calcium channel blockers? Well, I think currently it's are not sex specific, so I don't know that there's an efficacy issue. But young women love diuretics, uh, and old women love diuretics, but they probably get too dehydrated, and it's not a great idea. Um, ACE, ARB, not during childbearing, breastfeeding. Uh, beta blockers are, are great in women. Um, they don't like amlodipine because of the swelling. They don't like rapamil because of the constipation. So just years, 20 years of working with female patients and always you know, hearing their complaints about the drugs, I still tend to start with a diuretic, an ACE or an ARB in a non-childbearing woman. Beta blockers for any arrhythmia or you know, maybe they need a little adrenaline suppression, um, that type of thing. But I don't know of any studies that say one drug is better than another. If anyone in the audience does, I know we have a lot of researchers. Is there? Uh, I, I don't have any insights on the hypertension above you. I, I would say with respect to renolazine, because that's the drug that's often used for chest pain, I don't know if Olivia wants to comment on the efficacy of renolazine and women with chest pain and non-obstructive disease? Do you want to? We have a lot of interest in ranolazine because it doesn't seem to affect blood pressure or heart rates that much. And so it's helpful for especially women who have borderline blood pressures, so systolic blood pressures in the 90s, for example. I think the jury is still out as to how efficacious renolazine will be over the long term. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of studies currently ongoing uh, to kind of tease that out. We do know that renolazine is very good for chronic angina, and so that's where a lot of the basis is. Do you want to comment on the study you were involved in? 
So at Emory, we currently have a study on specifically renalazine in patients with non-obstructive disease. The vast majority of these people are women, um, but there are some men, and so the study itself is called MARINA, or Microvascular Assessment of Renalazine in Non-Obstructive Angina. And what we do there, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive study in the sense that um, we not only follow them pretty closely over a, about a three-month period, but we get um, cardiopulmonary exercise testing and uh, invasive cardiac catheterization with functional testing, both at the initial visit and at subsequent visits. So hopefully it's going to provide us a lot of in-depth data with regards to the comprehensive assessment of renalazine, but also of microvascular angina. And how are you doing on enrollment? Yeah, it's completed. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Sorry. Gina, uh, you want to comment at all about uh, stratification of women uh, based on calcium scores and how, how you utilize calcium score in the in your screening process? So calcium scores, I think, are, are very helpful in men. Very helpful in men and women, um, and I tell my patients this is our best early detection test to know how high risk you are. Um, it's also very good, uh, as you know from uh, the recent study was published in, in, in diabetics in determining risk. Um, because women tend to develop their atherosclerotic plaque up to 10 years after men, and it takes time for the calcification process to happen, I rarely recommend it before 50, uh, but I think it's a very good test after 50, but I tell most of my women, what we really want is for you to be zero at 65. Um, and the MESA data has certainly expanded so that um, we used to say, well, if you're over 70, you don't need the test. But as far as risk stratification, it's actually quite helpful even beyond 70 and 75. Um, the problem, as you know, is it's not paid for by any insurance. It's about $100 out of pocket. Um, and so this is a burden for some of the lower income patients to do. But particularly when I have a female who is struggling with, you know, testatin or not testatin, uh, I think the calcium information is very helpful. If uh, it comes back as a high risk, then she probably should lean toward that. One of the problems is the score can be quite low, even under 10, in a woman uh, 45 to 50, but that's still going to put her in the 90th percentile. And there's a lot of physicians who still kind of go by the old guideline that if the calcium score is under 100, you're fine. Well, that's not true in a younger patient, male or female. So um, I think the calcium score should be ordered by somebody who understands the data and interprets it properly. It's been a lot of talk this week with President Trump's calcium score and is it really low or high or whatever. Um, but I, I think too many... Um, People just walk in because it's direct to consumer and get the test, and then they don't know what it means. Oh, my score was five. I'm fine. Yeah, but you're 45. You're not fine. Uh, so I think it has. you really need to sit down with a physician who understands the test, the usefulness of the test, and also then what the patient's told. You don't necessarily have atherosclerosis, uh, coronary artery disease, but you certainly have, uh, if you want to call it pre-coronary artery disease or early detection of atherosclerotic plaque that's there that is calcified. But I think it's very helpful in women. And 50 to 55 is my sweet spot, not younger, unless they have FH or some premature family history where a primary relative, particularly a female relative, had a, a cardiovascular event prior to age 50. Then I do do it younger. The problem is the MESA data doesn't really apply to people under 45 also. So now you really don't know uh, what their risk is. But I think it's very helpful. Okay, well, with that, we thank you very much for a great talk. Thank really you. appreciate it, Gina. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.